All right, by a show of hands here, who knows why I'm holding a picture in my hand? Raffle drawing. Raffle drawing. Very good. We are giving away today a $50 Amazon gift card. In order to win that, you have to put your business card in this picture, which is going to be passed around. Start that up. Drop your business card in. If you don't have a business card, create one on any piece of paper that you find, be it paper towel, toilet paper, tissue paper, whatever you've got. Write on it your full business card information. If you only put your name and we call your name, it won't be good enough. You will not win. You need something equivalent to a business card, whatever you're making up. So before uh, we get on to the raffle, which will be at the end of the evening, we'll give it away. We normally will give away a whole bunch of swag. And today we have t-shirt swag to give away, but we're mixing it up a bit and we're not gonna give it away at the beginning, but the swag drawing will be at the end of tonight's event. So that's a little bit different than normal, but we will do, be doing a swag giveaway. On top of that, uh, I would like to introduce, we have two speakers today, Joe Sherman, who's right over there, and Greg Luck, who's right over there. Uh, Joe Sherman is going to, Sherwin, excuse me, is going to start us off, and without further ado, Joe. Thank you. I, how's everyone doing? Uh, I had to survive a snowmageddon to get down here from Connecticut. Um, I appreciate all of you guys coming. Um, I'm a, my name is Joe Sherwin. I'm from a company called Hazelcast. Um, now today's speaker is going to talk about uh, the, what's the cutting edge in big data stream processing. And Hazelcast is a company that sells two products. Um, Hazelcast IMDG, in memory data grid, and Hazelcast Jet. These products enable some of the uh, capabilities that, and, and new forms and methods of doing data processing um, against multiple nodes in a fault tolerant manner. Um, so these two products is what our companies uh, sell. These, com these two products are available um, as open source um, online. Uh, if you guys interested, you can take a look. Um, so I'm just going to go through some really quick capabilities. The first product is the uh, in-memory data grid. I'm um, not sure if you guys are familiar with using in-memory NoSQL databases and things like that. And, and that's what um, uh, Hazelcast IMDG does. It uh, allows you to scale your system of record and not have to deal with latencies and things like that. Um, that really plagues the web scale applications and new um, solutions that we're building today. Um, especially in, in the world of big data, um, internet of things, and, and so forth. So those challenges of low latency, high performance type applications, that's what JET and um, IMDG is geared uh, towards solving. So here's a list of some of the uh, industries that's using our products right now. Um, as you can see, we're heavy in banking and financial services, telecom, uh, e-commerce, um, gaming, entertainment, um, and high-tech applications. Um, and you know, in the ecosystem track, we have a lot of uh, third parties who actually embed our product in, in their offerings. Um, also, I'd like to mention that we're having a uh, free training session for Hazelcast IMDG, um, March 20th and 21st um, in New York and New Jersey. And um, you guys can check it out at these uh, links. Um, it's a 10 to 2, both of them. Um, I'd like you to be there if you can. So Jet is the one of the, the second product in our offering is very interesting and, and, and um, enables some of the things that uh, Greg will be discussing. Um, it's a distributed data processing engine. Um, you know when you when you start talking about um, large, big data, fast moving data, um, infinite streams, fast batch processing, those kinds of problems at scale. Um, Jet is the engine um, that helps build those types of solutions. 
So again, like I said, it's fault tolerant, uh, DAC based, distributed memory stream, batch processing engine, built on top of the IMDG um, core. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Greg Luck. Greg is my boss. He's the CEO of Hazelcast. Hey, thanks, Greg. third generation 
stream processing engine. Um, so meanwhile, um, Google actually moved away themselves from MapReduce and they, uh, they've come out with, with two papers which are quite significant. Um, one is Flume Java and the other one is Millwheel. And um, Hazardcast uh, Jet uses watermarks and that's one of the concepts that's from Millwheel. Um, now, what Google have done here is a little different, which is that they're using the tech themselves internally. They've also created a managed service called Google Cloud Dataflow. Um, so they haven't open sourced this technology. It's a proprietary service that you can run from them. But they're kind of taking their technology and making it available to you. Everybody, I kind of feel that this microphone, I can't quite get the, the balance right. It's a bit tough. So I'm either yelling or whispering. I'll do my best. Um, so, um, third generation systems, this is my own definition. Not sure if any other analysts, or well, not that I'm an analyst, but not sure if anybody uh, subscribes to this point of view. But I think of JET, the thing that we built, as a third generation system. And, and what I think the third, what characterizes third generation systems is that they're all DAG based, so they inherit that from Spark. Um, they, they have learned the mistakes and the lessons from the previous system. I think that's key. They're also informed by academic papers. I know that our engineers read all these papers, all the Google papers and a lot of other stuff floating around. Um, the other thing is that the whole, this whole concept of micro-batch that people were doing with Spark for a long time is, is seen as a failure because it gives the, the, the latency is, is the inverse of the batch size. So the smaller you make your batch size, the lower the latency you can get. That's kind of limiting. So what's much better is a true streaming architecture where you can emit an output with as little as a single event coming in. So that's kind of the true native streaming approach. Um, so all of the third generation systems now, also including Spark streaming, have, uh, do that. And the other thing is that the focus of third generation systems is streaming. Now that's not to say that batch has been forgotten. Batch is still there, but Batch is actually just seen as a specific type of streaming. Specifically, um, uh, it's a stream that's finite rather than infinite. And uh, secondly, you're not interested in actually calculating um, intermediate results, which, you, which in, in, streaming, in streaming it's infinite, and you have a concept of a window, and you calculate results with respect to a window. The other thing I'd say about third generation systems is the plethora of choice. So, you know, uh, I, I don't know about everybody in the audience, but I've actually lived through these eras, and the Hadoop thing was huge. You know, the Stratic conferences and everything, um, and there was kind of this idea that Hadoop was a dominant meme, and there was just a universe that you could lose yourself in with Hadoop. And, um, and then Spark was a very, very strong contender that came along, and then Spark was seen as okay too. So you could either, you know, if you're big data, you're Hadoop, or you know, or maybe you're Spark. I think what's different now, as you'll see, is that there's many choices, and I think it's acceptable um, to be using more than one thing. We were we were um, at a bank this afternoon, and that bank is using um, Spark, Storm, and Flink, and that's actually pretty common now. Um, not to see not to see a single system being used. So um, I think the idea is that there's no silver bullet. You look at you look at what the features and characteristics are. Maybe you use more than one system. I certainly hope that's true. Otherwise, we've got no hope. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's so let's so now we're talking about generation one. What's actually going on? So. I don't know about you guys, but we always, in product companies, we always look at Google Trends. It's a pretty reliable bellwether. So you can see the last 11 years of Hadoop, you see it take off and then start to decline uh, in 2014. And then you can see it relative to Spark. As you can see, it's, there's still a lot more, um, there's still a lot more mentions of Hadoop than there is Spark, but it's in decline. 
Now, um, for those people who are in the streaming industry, they consider that Hadoop is actually obsolete. Um, Gartner came out with their, uh, they came out with this, uh, this report, um, middle of 2017, uh, and uh, you can just, you may be able to see it. This is uh, Hadoop here. So it's actually got a, a red circle with a cross, and what Gartner is saying is I think it will be obsolete before it reaches the plateau of productivity. So um, what I see, talking to a lot of customers and potential customers, is people are wholesale uninstalling Hadoop. They've got their you know, map bar of Cloudera distros, they're not renewing them, they're uninstalling it. Now, I was in Japan a couple of months ago and um, went and visited some tech companies there and they were telling us proudly how they were number three or number four in the Hadoop market. So, you know, as William Gibson says, the future is here, it's not just, it's just not evenly distributed. So, you know, you go to places like Japan, Hadoop is still going, going strong, you go to Silicon Valley and, and MapReduce is considered obsolete and Hadoop is considered obsolete. The parts of Hadoop that live on are HTFS um, and, you know, Zookeeper and, and some of the other infrastructure. Okay, um, now Spark, if we take Hadoop out of the picture and we look at Spark, so Spark's been pretty strong um, for a number of years now. Um, actually, it's kind of stabilised almost exactly at the time that Hadoop started uh, dropping off. Now, um, those other little squiggly coloured lines are basically everybody else in the market. So the way the market looks today is that, is that Spark is now dominant, but you've got these other players in the so-called third generation. Now, what happens if we remove Spark from the mix? So here's the rest. Uh, this doesn't include us, by the way. I'm leaving us out of this. Um, so there's more than what's on here, but you know, one of the things that's been increasing um, is, is capital streams. Um, Google Cloud Dataflow um, is kind of relatively stable. Um, Apache Flink is also um, quite stable, although I do see it getting used uh, more. Right, so, um, I'm not sure how we're going to do this because I've got a very, very data-rich um, page. In fact, it doesn't fit into a um, PowerPoint. But they're, they're, the, they're the different uh, systems that I've surveyed and actually looked at. Um, so what I might do is... Everybody see that? Is that, uh, yeah, okay. All right. We could probably spend the rest of the 45 minutes on this slide, uh, which so we're not going to. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just, this is a survey of what I consider third generation systems, so I'll just kind of pick out some of the highlights. So before I mentioned that there were a plethora of systems, um, like we don't even have Storm on here. I mean, Twitter here has come along and kind of replaced uh, storm. But if you look at if you look at these players, there's us. So we're Hazelcast Jet. Yeah, that's us on the left. Um, you've got um, you know. If you look at each of these projects, um, let's look at when they were released. So you know, Spark was originally released in 2010. Um, you've got Flink. Flink was actually, Flink, which is only really getting a bit of mind share now, the last year or so, is actually goes back to 2008. Um, Kafka Streams, that was the SAMHSA project, it got released as Kafka Streams, it's doing well in 2016. Um, Akka Streams, the guys from Whitebend, um, that goes back to 2015. Um, Intel is out there with an open source project called Apache Gear Pump. Um, so, you know, one, one way of looking at things is the number of stars. Obviously, Spark is massive compared to everybody else, as indicated by Google Trends. Um, interestingly as well, if you look across this market, um, basically everybody is a startup backed by VC money, um, except for Google Cloud Dataflow, which is backed by them, and Apache 
gear pump, which is just backed by, essentially backed by Intel, um, just funding their developers. Um, so, you know, what we'll, what we'll cover tonight is, is um, once we get beyond the survey, is a little bit about Hazelcast Jet. So we're actually brand new in this space. Um, we actually have low mind share. That's one of the reasons I'm here, but it's because we're new. Um, Hazelcast itself does not have low mind share. Um, um, another thing that's kind of interesting, um, so Google, so there's a, there's a project called Apache Beam, and Apache Beam is, a, is an API. Um, and it's an API that Google uh, have been promoting for Google Cloud Dataflow. And it's kind of a strategic thing for them. They'd be going around talking to all that streaming platform saying, hey, can you use Apache Beam? So the idea is that people write to the Apache Beam API, and then having written an application that way, you can actually go and deploy it with Google Cloud Dataflow. So um, you'll see there, one, two, three, four, five, uh, five implementations of Apache Beam. Um, we ourselves have not gone there yet, simply because Beam, Beam 1 was quite ugly and difficult to use. Beam 2 is better, so we actually may implement it. Um, um, the other thing is you'll see a mix of, a mix of APIs. Um, the, the link and, and language support. You'll see a bit of SQL. We don't do SQL. I mean, by far the most common uh, is Java uh, across the board. You've got uh, followed by Scala and then followed by Python. Um, as you can see, the computation model is streaming for everybody. Um, the exception to that was um, Spark. But with Spark 2.3, they've actually got continuous processing, as I mentioned before. So then this is, a bit, basically there's, there's so much support behind Spark, they actually keep changing their architecture and they keep modernizing it. Um, another way to look at things is, is latency. So this is based on our benchmarks and our studies. Um, your knowledge might, might vary. Um, and, and throughput. So um, more on that later. Um, another interesting one is delivery guarantees. So um, exactly once um, is, is you know, the most common. Some people only offer exactly once, like Google Cloud Dataflow. Um, what, is, what is kind of, I think, considered best in class is to offer all three guarantees, exactly once, at least once, and then no guarantee. The reason for offering no guarantee would be when you want to offer, when you want to promote performance above all else. And with no guarantee, you don't do snapshotting. Um, another another area here is connectors, and connectors are a sign of maturity. Like we consider Jet low maturity, um, we consider Spark high maturity, and so you can see, you know, a huge number of connectors. Connectors are not that hard to write, at least not in JET. They're usually just about a single A4 page of code. So we will be ourselves coming out with many more. And Google Cloud Dataflow has got tons. Um, and then the other one is resource management, how that's done. So, um, yeah, I don't, know, I don't quite know how to share this. If anybody is interested, this is a pretty up-to-date um, survey of what's out there. If anybody's kind of interested in this, Perhaps give me your email and I'll just send you a, export this as a PDF and send it out to you. Does anybody have any, like at this point in the talk, what I'm now going to do is, is having been through the generations, then actually start zeroing in a bit more onto um, Hazelcast Jet. Does anybody have any questions um, about that part before I move on? Yes, yes I am. <laughs> um, before I do, uh, one thing that uh, one thing that our, our lead on Jet did, which is kind of very much a Java developer mindset, is basically walk you through and kind of show you what 
what word count would look like if you implemented it single-threaded naively and then step through all the bits that you add to sort of end up with a full-blown solution. So it's quite an interesting perspective and I think what's true of us and the way we do things is probably true of the whole third generation category. So let, let's go and step through that. This is really hard holding this thing while I use the keyboard. Um, so so in, a, in a single thread world uh, in Java, this is what it would look like. You control, uh, control a pattern um, with a space separator. Um, we've, got, um, we've got lines in a hash map. We're going to iterate through that. And then we're going to, um, we're going to count. Now, um, now, things to know uh, is, that, is that a single thread, regardless of how many cores you have, a single thread is actually going to be uh, is going to be running along and doing this. So you're very very limited to scalability. Um, so now let's actually represent this computation as a DAG. So we've got a source. We've got a, a first stage, which is tokenized, our first um, uh, vertice, uh, and then we're going to accumulate. Um, so so far, even though we represented this as a DAG, we don't actually get any performance benefit or scalability benefit. To get the first uh, benefit, one thing we can do is we can let um, each of the stages run at their own speed. So, so that's what that little uh, Q, uh, Q shows. Um, now, in, um, so, so Martin Thompson, have probably heard of Martin Thompson? He's a bit of a performance guru. So he's got, a, um, he's got a, a very high performance queue called a single producer, single consumer queue. Um, this is what we use in, in Hazelcast Jet. This is part of our secret, secret source. Um, but conceptually, you let each of these things um, uh, run at their own speed, so you've got concurrent queues. Now, um, and, and, and what's implied here, um, obviously, is that you have you have um, you have a thread um, you have a thread reading from the source. You have another thread at tokenize, uh, another thread for accumu the accumulator, and another thread for the sync. So you've got four threads. Now, um, the next thing that you can do, even that this is DAG, is you can look for parallelization opportunities. Um, and so here, you can actually break that first uh, tokenized step um, uh, up. Now we showed two here, but you can do you can do n. So you read in lines and you emit words. Um, so we've added another thread. So now we've got one, two, three, four, five threads. We're still still single machine. Um, now of course, what you can also do is by um, at the accumulator. If we introduce accumulate by partition, um, so let's say the word the, let's say the is in the top accumulator and Joe Sherman, oh, sorry, Joe, is in the bottom accumulator and so on, um, then, you, then you can partition and you can keep adding accumulators, but you, the, you keep staring at me like, uh, <laughs> you keep, um, I keep waiting for him to say something, but maybe he will. Um, the accumulate stage, um, so you partition. So now we've got this, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, but you can actually have n threads. We're still limited to the uh, same machine. We just have to make sure that the same words go to the same accumulator. So we've got, regardless of which tokenizer, they need to actually be partitioned and they need to send things to the right accumulator. But you can keep scaling. So, you know, what I was saying before about DAG allowing optimization across the whole DAG, this is an example of what I'm talking about. So now, um, having done that, we can now then move beyond a single machine. And um, so the yellow lines are where uh, we're partitioning, but now it's a distributed partitioning scheme. Now, interestingly, Hazelcast is an in-memory data grid, and, just, and having a being distributed and being partitioned is kind of our bread and butter. So this fits very well with us. And then once you go to this model, then you can have, um, oh, we've added combining at this step as well. Um, so now you can, um, 
Now you can have a very large number of threads and you have a very large number of machines. And so this is kind of the essence of how DAGs, DAG um, architectures are used to scale. Um, they pretty much all have this in common. Okay, so, so I'm now going to move on and talk a little bit about JET. Um, so, you know, the first release of JET was February 2017, um, which was point three. We did a point one and a point two as private internal releases, and then we did a point Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, so we we um so we are new to this game. We're not new to distributed computing, but we're new to this game. Um, so we actually kicked Jet off um, in 2014. Mid 2014, we were developing it sort of under covers. Um, first with a single developer, then we added a, a, a team, and um, and then the first release was was in uh, February 2017. So we've done 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, and 0.6 is in feature freeze right now, and uh, will be coming out in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so it is it is a general purpose uh, third generation uh, data processing engine, um, similar to those others in the category, um, and it uses um, kind of what the what the model looks like is is we support stream and batch processing. Um, Hazelcast Jet interestingly embeds Hazelcast itself and it uses Hazelcast in memory data grid for its low level services. That gives us a lot of very very easy wins. Um, one thing just to point out here is that if you want to enrich um, a stream processing system, enriching from a uh, source that's in memory is your best bet. It's one thing that you get for free with Hazelcast Jet. Okay, so um, taking that entire survey and then just you know zeroing in on what 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 the differentiators specifically for Jet are. These are the ones that I think we are um, high performance, and I'm going to show you some data in a moment. Um, the other one is, is, is anybody, I mean this is a big data group, so I'm not sure if actually anybody at all would actually be a Hazelcast in memory data grid user. Um, but we do have plenty of them, and um, having something that is, works very, very easily and well with it, I think is a big plus if you've already got Hazelcast in your infrastructure. Um, very simple to program. I'll show you our APIs, you tell me. Um, we put a huge amount of effort into trying to make that true. Um, what, we, what we know for sure is that we are very simple to deploy. So um, Hazelcast itself is, is about a 10 meg jar. Um, we're a little bigger than that, actually. Should I update that? Probably about more like 12 or 13 meg. Um, but you can be, we can be either embedded or client server. And the key thing is that there are no dependencies. So unlike other frameworks where you have, have lots of other moving parts, this does not have any other moving parts. And you can deploy on premise, you can deploy in every cloud. We have about 12 plugins for all the different cloud environments. Um, we support, you know, OpenShift, we support Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, so it makes deployment very, very easy. And if you think about it, let's say you've got a, um, a Spring Boot app, got three nodes, drop in Jet, drop Jet into each of those, forms a three node cluster, you can have stream processing as an application concern without any infrastructure. So how simple is that? Um, the other thing is that this is for Java developers. It's the only language that we support. So it's by developers, for developers. That's kind of where we fit. Um, let's just sort of take these in turn now. We'll talk about performance. Um, so we have a per flat. It's, it's got uh, 10, 10 modern machines. Um, we've got uh, one gig network. Um, 
got uh, rotational disks and we've also got SSDs. Um, so what we've done here is using rotational disks, we've got HDFS, um, HDFS and then we're actually testing um, exactly the same um, amount of source data running word count through it. So um, this is this is like Jet.4 a couple of releases ago, Spark 2.1, Link 1.2 one release ago. Forget about the green line for now. Um, so what we uh, what our tests indicate are that we are more than double the performance of Spark or Flink. And that mileage varies depending on the number of unique words in the word count and the size of the data. So that's the first thing. The second thing though is that is the green column. Now this is not apples to apples, this is apples to oranges. Specifically what we've done here is instead of um, storing the books in HDFS, we've taken the same data but we've made the starting point a Hazelcast IMAP. So because we're an in-memory data grid, our assumption is that the starting point for lots of people will be to already have their data in memory in the grid. Now, if it is in memory in the grid, you get a massive performance benefit, as you would expect. Um, one of the things you know going on under the covers is that we've got um, Hazelcast Jet and Hazelcast IMDG are harmonised um, with their consistent hashing schemes and their partitions. Um, you can you can do you can use lots and lots of cores and keep scaling this thing and keep making it faster. Now, um, that was a batch example. Now the other one is a streaming example. So this is some code we've got, a streaming trade monitor. Uh, it's one of the code samples. And, um, and here, once again, testing against Flink and Spark. Um, and these are the latencies that we, that we achieved um, on our aggregator. Um, and you see it stays quite flat as the number of messages per second goes up. So, so I guess this is, this is the backing that we have to our claim that we are high performance. Um, one thing to note, the Spark comparisons, uh, we're using Tungsten, which is the extra sort of high performance library that they have. Now I mentioned before that, um, you know, one of our sort of other niches is the Hazelcast community, and that community is, is huge. So this is the number of um, phone homes we get per month, and that's how it's been growing over the last four years. So um, bringing that up to date, it's running at about 40 million. It was running at 40 million, I think, for January. Um, so this means every time somebody starts a Hazelcast node, or once per day, if the node stays running, so there's an absolutely huge community out there. We had an interesting, just to sort of illustrate this point, we kind of had an interesting meeting this afternoon. We went into one of the banks here, and um, these guys don't pay us any money uh, for support, which is sad. Um, but what's very, very good is that you're making very, very wide use of Hazelcast, and they're quite expert at it. Um, and we kind of talked to them about Jet, and they're like, yeah, well, that's fantastic. We'll get, get started with it. We'll use it for ingesting data into Hazelcast. Um, and so we kind of, you know, so Hazelcast is an in-memory data grid. We are by far the most widely used in-memory data grid. Others in that category are things like Coherence and Gemfire, uh, Grid Gain Ignite, um, JBoss data grid. So we've kind of built a huge community um, and we want to build another one uh, with Jet. Um, I talked before about um, some deployment options, just to underline that. Um, so with embedded, you just stick the jar in your in your app server or your Uber jar, and it can form its own cluster. So this is absolutely fantastic for microservices. Um, very very simple for ops. The other thing you can do is you can also use a client server. And so here you would be running um, here you would have a, a Jet cluster and you'd use the Jet client to connect to it. So having having that. Um, that, you know, having simple embeddability, I think, is quite a unique uh, aspect. Um, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do now, is just show off a couple of um, a 
couple of demo apps. Um, so, um, let's put this down for a moment. Yeah, so, you know, one thing to sort of show, show that, you know, show what can be done is, is to have, is to have a demo apps. So we've got these, we've got these demos, um, but quite a wide, a wide range. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you two, and then um, I'm going to kind of quickly show you kind of the guts of the code that's driving each one, and then, um, and then we'll kind of continue on. Um, so, so the first one is uh, is a cryptocurrency sentiment analyzer. So it uses a deep learning model. Um, it's doing natural language processing, and this is quite hard with one hand. Um, is that something wrong? There it is. Okay, so and so what this one does is um, so what we do is we connect to a Twitter source using um, a developer account, and then we're actually looking for mentions of Bitcoin and some of the other currencies. We use a natural language processor, and then to do sentiment analysis as to whether it's positive or negative. And then we score that, um, and then we aggregate that by different time intervals. Um, the, the DAG visualization actually looks like that. And to show you the, um, show you the app, so I'm just running this from Maven. Um, Pazacast starts up. Um, what you see there, you know, what we do is we emit the DAG. So this is the actual um, DAG that we're executing. Um, and then we'll start accumulating data. Um, I've, been, I've run this a couple of times today, and oh, Bitcoin's gone positive. Everything this afternoon has been negative. Um, I ran it um, about three weeks ago when I was in Asia, and it was incredibly negative. I'm like, what's going on? And that was. That was the crash going on. Um, so to now to look at the code that drives that. Um, so so what we do is um, we have a pipeline API which I'll talk about in a minute. We build a pipeline. We create a new Jet instance, um, and then we submit the pipeline to a new JET job, and then we join. Something interesting about JET is we can run hundreds of jobs concurrently. We don't really have scale limitations. A lot of, a lot of other systems like Spark and stuff can't really do more than about five or 10 jobs concurrently. We can do a lot. Um, and then the pipeline itself, that's it. That's, that's the entire code um, for the pipeline. So you... Um, So that's that one. Okay, next one. Showing something else you can do quite easily. Um, we have a another example. We have is flight telemetry. So there's a um, there's a public source on the AD, ADBS exchange of flight telemetry for all commercial aircraft flying anywhere in the world. And so we actually poll this once every five seconds. This one's a bit more compl complex of a DAG. So we'll actually read that in. What we're doing is we're, um, we're filtering, we're enriching, so we're enriching the aircraft with, with information about um, the engines and how much fuel they burn, how much CO2 they emit, also how much noise they make. 
So that's kind of an example of, um, of enrichment. Uh, and then we put it all on a nice uh, Grafana chart. So um, let me kick that off. So what should be getting quite obvious to you now, if you're a Java 8 programmer, this is a pretty natural sort of in, uh, development environment and experience. You don't need to learn Scala, you don't need, uh, you don't need other infrastructure. Everything just works very easily from a development environment on your, on your, um, on your laptop. All right, so this will take a while to populate. We do have New York in here. So we'll see if, uh, if New York's actually, if the airport's closed or not. So then we're just outputting this to Grafana. Don't have quite enough data yet. While we're waiting for that to populate, I'll show you what the code looks like for this one. Oh, by the way, um, so in keeping with the Hazelcast way, um, all this stuff is, is very, um, is very accessible. So, there's the... Um, Alright, I'm going to juggle the, uh, the old people again. So, um... So um, if you go to download, you've got the code samples, you've got the demo apps. What that looks like in, um, in GitHub. So we're in a, we're Apache 2, Hazelcast, IMDG, and Jet are Apache 2. Um, the idea that we have is in, in Hazelcast, we have IMDG, we have more than 500 code samples. Each code sample is really easy to use. Uh, we do the same thing with, with Jet to make it easy to get started. I've got these pinned at the top here. So, you know, here's the Hazelcast uh, code samples. And uh, we have the demos as well, uh, right there with all the source. So... So there's the repo for the jet demos. Um, right, so if we have a look at um, flight telemetry, this is a quite a complex example. Right, so there's the there's the main method there. Um, similar thing, you create a new jet uh, new jet instance, you create a pipeline. Um, And then we, uh, we submit the pipeline to a job. This one's using a sliding window. And then we've got, um, we've got all these different things that we do that are all um, expressed in the pipeline. So um, I'll, show you the, um, I'll show you the demo. It should be populated now. Um, right, there we go. So stuff that data that we're extracting out of out of the stream. Um, so looking at looking at changes in elevation in the telemetry, we're determining if, if the flight has taken off. We're also determining if the flight has landed. Um, um, so where's New York? 16 flights. It's quite it's quite busy right now. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know which airport. It might be all three. Um, and then you've got CO2 emissions and you've got maximum noise. So red is the highest noise right now, which is New York. Um, and also the Mac, it's also got the most CO2 emissions. Not entirely sure how accurate that data is, but I guess the noise one is probably pretty accurate. Um, right, so that, um, let me fill those guys off. So 
So right, let me go back to the slideshow mode. I would kill for a white wall mic right now. Um, so I said before that, that Jet embeds, embeds has a cast iron DG. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. So, so the networking and cluster management are all done by um, are all done by Hazelcast, which means we can reuse the, that we work in all these different cloud environments um, and deployment environments, um, which is very good. Um, so you know, in Hazelcast Jet, we've got job management, we've got the DAG execution engine, we've got fault tolerance, uh, we've got the core API. More about that in a minute. We've got batch and stream processing. We've got the readers and writers, and then we've got two high-level APIs. So what I'll do now is um, I will uh, turn to the APIs. So the APIs, all the examples that I've been showing, showing you so far, use the pipeline API. It's called the pipeline API because you build a pipeline, as was evident from the demos. Um, we've got two other types. Um, we've got kind of, it's almost like a learning API. It's called Java Util, it, so it's our Java Util Stream API. So is anybody here a Java 8 programmer? There you go. Um, yeah, so in Java 8 you've got Java Util Stream. One of the things that we do in Jet is we provide a distributed version of Java Util Stream. Um, so um, you can, um, it's kind of an easy on-ramp to get going with Jet. Um, one of the problems with Java Util Stream, rather ironically, is that it does not support streaming, despite its name. So, um, and the other one is that it doesn't support joins. Um, so it's, it's basically batch, it's simple batch only. Um, let me show you what that looks like. So that's word count in Java Util Stream. Um, we've also got it in the code samples. Um, so we have distributed, um, just simply distributed, uh, we, have, we have interfaces that extend um, the Java Util Stream and, and uh, to be distributed. Now the, um, the, the other one is the pipeline API. This is a high level API. Um, you can use all of the JET features in it and um, we were looking at uh, Oh. That's a uh, word count. That's a simple word count example in the pipeline API. So you can see it's declarative. Um, you type, say what you want it to do, um, not how you want to do it. Um, and it's fluent and it's very, very recognizable um, to, to you know, Java programmers. Um, the other one is the core API or our DAG API. And this is the this was the very first API that we, we wrote. Um, so this at the middle of last year, this is all we had, and we had a um, we have an annual conference for our solution architects. Joe's one of our solution architects. So they all went over to Copenhagen. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, jet point pours out. Everybody can write demo applications. And guess what? Absolutely nobody could actually use the API. And then we got um, Ben Evans. So Ben Evans had created um, Jet Leopard, demonstrating how to use Spark with Hazelcast. And then he tried, and we said, okay, Ben, we'll get you to do it. You know, you know about the stuff. And then he tried to do it. And guess what? He couldn't use it either. So that's when we kind of knew we had a problem with this API, that it was just too difficult. Um, interestingly, people have come along who are experts, true experts, that actually love it because it gives them a lot of power and it's very low level. So I'll show you what that looks like. It, it also, it is kind of the, the way the pipeline API works is that we, we put it through a, a, a planner and the planner basically emits and then executes the core API. Um, so it's, it, the core API is kind of like the native API of Jet. So um, this, is the, this is word count in the DAG API. So when, when we talk about Jet being a DAG-based system, that becomes entirely evident when you look at this API. You see, what you do is you, you create a new DAG, you create vertices, um, and then you actually join them with edges. Um, now, um, 
to, to show a more complex example, um, if we go back to the cryptocurrency real-time trend, so this is the this kind of single screenful of code is the is how you do it with our pipeline API, and then um, we've actually got in here uh, the same example done with the core API. So that's the core API. So you create the DAG, create the vertices, um, create the sliding windows. Um, we've got watermarks. Um, yeah, and then you go and create this, uh, create your vertices and create your edges. So it kind of turns out that pretty much nobody outside the jet engineering team knows how to use this API, except for a couple of very expert users. Um, yeah, so when I said before that we have a simple API, it's taken us about a year and a half to actually get to the pipeline API. Which So, so I mean, what's the feedback? You guys are probably familiar with other um, streaming engines, the pipeline API look pretty good to you. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully success. Um, and so all of the, actually the demos, the demos were actually a mix of pipeline API and um, core API that all been converted to the pipeline API. Um, now, just before I wrap up, um, just some um, Just some other things. I talked before about um, processing guarantees, so we support all three. Um, there is a trade-off, so um, so no processing guarantees is not use snapshots. Now, if you're doing batch processing, um, um, sorry, if you if you if if it's possible to replay the stream, say with the Kafka source, where you can just pass in the offset, you just want to go super fast, you could actually use. Uh, no processing guarantee, it just depends. Um, and then with at least once and exactly once, we're actually using um, snapshots to support that. Um, stream processing, um, so we, we support out of order delivery via watermarks. That's out of the um, that Google paper, that approach is becoming quite common to use watermarks now. What, what you kind of find, um, one of our guys actually looked at the the latest Spark streaming stuff, and he's like, oh yeah, it's like almost exactly the same as Flink. So what's going on now is that these third generation kind of frameworks are actually looking at each other and copying ideas, which I think is kind of a good thing. Um, there's no need to reinvent some of these wheels. So we support sliding, tumbling, and session windows. Um, we've got really nice fault tolerance. So because Hazelcast in-memory data grid is a distributed data grid, um, it is, we get that basically for free. So by storing our snapshots in IMAP, there's, there's an active and there's a backup. Um, it's replicated, um, it's highly available. Um, IMAPs themselves actually can be configured to have up to five uh, replicas, um, although typically one is used. Uh, we support automatic re-execution. Um, one thing that we do, if, if you lose a node, it will just automatically re-execute from the last snapshot. And um, the other thing you can do is you can, Hazelcast IMG is elastic architecture, so you can actually add nodes, and the systems using consistent hashing will actually just move partitions across to the new nodes and actually balance the, balance the workload from a data storage point of view in the IMDG. And when it comes to JET, we do the same thing. So with JET, up till 0.5, so, so as a 0.5, um, whatever the nodes, so you can add nodes, doesn't interrupt the job execution. You only get the benefit of the new nodes when you start a new job. That was up to 0.5. But as a 0.6, um, you can actually you can actually um, pause and restart your job, and it will actually pick up midstream and actually use the new hardware um, midstream. Um, so that's kind of a nice trick. Um, and um, I mean, there's a lot more to say about uh, there's a lot more to say about Jet, but um, we're at about uh, I think we're at about 60 minutes since Joe started talking, so I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, um, once again, there's a bit of a plug for the free training uh, next week. If you want to check uh, Jet out, the home of Jet is is jet.hazelcast.org. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of 
of this thing, uh, let me know it, and I'll just um, export it as a PDF and send it to you. Um, the information will go start going stale almost immediately, but it's quite a good up-to-date um, summary of the current state of things. Um, yeah, and there's, uh, there's Jet with Hazelcast at all. So, I guess at this point, we open it up to questions, right? Yes, before we do that, though, I just want to remind everybody, we are giving away a $50 Amazon gift card. There's a jar of junk running around the room. Does anyone know where that is? Right there. Where? Back there. Okay, well, anyway, it'll pass around the room again. Put your business card in there or anything that resembles a business card, and you have a chance to win that. Also, right after Q&A, we will be giving away swag. These are, I believe, T-shirts. Yeah. When you guys have finished asking me questions, I'm actually going to ask you questions. It's actually an exam based on content tonight. So we'll be giving away right after Q&A. So this is, uh, this is the newest streaming uh, uh, stream processing engine with the lowest mind share. And you'll actually get a t-shirt to celebrate that. Um, okay, well I might... Um, I might... Uh, I might ask a, ask a question. Um, so, um, so what are the three window types uh, uh, in stream processing? Wow. Okay. <laughs> no one's asking me any questions, so um, I'm asking them. He's got his head up. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, when you think about the third generation that you mentioned earlier, how does the aspect of, of the proprietary uh, handicap or, or not handicap. So for like a, a Google, they have a distribution platform that you know, they can proprietary, they can get a lot of uh, stuff out of it. But you guys, I guess a little bit less widely spread or at least more in regulated industries or global good balance. So how do you how do you view the, the trajectory of your product compared to the other players here? Okay, so the question is about proprietary versus um, open source. Um, so what you what you observe is true. So there's the data there. In fact, the only proprietary system is Google. Google is the only one that doesn't open source their system. They do publish papers, and they publish an open source API, but not the system itself. Um, here's the sad truth of enterprise software today. If you're not, if you're not open source, you're basically dead. So um, I'd have to go back six years ago, I think it was. Um, so it says there that Apache Apex um, was launched in 2015. That is correct. But Data Torrent, before that, they actually had Data Torrent, which was proprietary. Those guys were out of Yahoo Finance. When I first saw that thing uh, at Estrada, it blew me away. I'm like, wow, this thing is amazing. But what they did is they went enterprise closed source and tried to sell licenses. And guess what? I mean, look at their. And then they, and then they open sourced in 2015. I mean, we, we've been going about a year. We've got 200 stars, we've got 280 stars. I mean, so they, they've got no traction at all. But yet, Data Torrent was amazing, like five years ago, enterprise proprietary. It's just, everyone, everyone is spoiled. I mean, open source, open source is one. And, uh, I mean, as of past, I mean, we're cash flow positive, we've got a reasonable business. So probably the good old days of enterprise software was 20 years ago, when there was no open source. Do something good, you just charge licenses for it. I mean, those days are gone. So, the cost source you were sharing earlier is everything, not just the everything. Code. Everything is everything is open source. Every repository is open. Everything is Apache too. Everything that I've shown you tonight. And that is, the, I mean, I don't mention the license here, but that's true of everyone except for except for Google. Now, Google have got a different. Uh, if you look at Diane Green, she came from VMware, and she's actually in charge of Google Cloud at Google. You kind of look at what she's doing, it's quite clever. They've got this like, um, she is popularizing the frameworks and APIs available on um, GCP, and then she wants people to sort of write things and then, and then run them there. Like, like last week, there was some, there was some free training on, on AI and TensorFlow. So they've got a thing called TensorFlow when it comes to uh, um, deep learning, right? So you can go and actually use TensorFlow and run that run that on your own desktop. But then you can take exactly the same code that you've written and go and run it up with GCP. So I think that's the model that she's using to try and drive growth of GCP. It's quite different to the Amazon strategy. 
Um, so yeah, that's Google's strategy. So, so make the APIs free, um, give you a kind of a developer experience, but then make it available to run there. But for everybody else, everybody else is 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 open source. Now, if you look at Amazon, Amazon have got a thing called Kinesis. I mean, one of the things that's getting up the up the noses of the VCs that are funding all this is if you look at Amazon's business model, they just take popular open source projects and go, okay, that's good. We'll actually make that a managed service, we'll make that a native managed service on, on Amazon. So there's, um, there's, I know there's kind of a bit of a pushback on that. There's, there's some discussions about changing the open source licenses to specifically prevent Amazon doing stuff like that. But that has, I don't know if that'll happen. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's all open source. Happy days. Take your pick of the third generation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Hazelcast is all Dockerized today. Uh, if, that's, if that's the answer to your question, you know. The, uh, so, yeah, I probably shouldn't have mentioned it at all. Um, what, what happened is um, about a month and a half ago, we, we, have, we have, twice a year we have an engineering conference. So all of, all of the Hazelcast engineers actually are all in Europe. There's three in the US, everybody else is in Europe. Um, so we all fly them together. And then um, we have a three-day conference. We work together all week. We have a three-day conference. And then on the third day, uh, we have Project X. And basically, Project X is just you, you organise yourself into teams and try and come up with something cool. So, like, I'm almost embarrassed to be in the same room as some of these people, actually. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, so, so Basri, Basri um, is one of our architects. He's like, oh, yeah, that would be really handy to have that that feature of being able to elastically scale within a single job. Like before, you can only take advantage of the extra hardware when you start a job. So what he did, it was a little bit of a hack. It was a, um, you know, it was like a pause and restart, a, a pause and resume, that then takes, then it will actually use it. But that's actually not the true feature. The true feature is being added in point seven. It will actually automatically do it without intervention. So that's the real feature that's coming in point seven. Yeah, I mean something I didn't, not, but sort of details that I didn't mention, I mentioned about all the concurrent jobs. Um, we have a distributed task, task loader, so when you create a job and you, you go to execute it, um, it and it's associated, um, so you can add things to its, it, its class loader and that gets distributed around. I guess that's all pretty just, you don't even mention that anymore because that's just standard, right? But we have all those tricks as well, yeah. Right. Um, one of the things that I've heard you talk about <clears throat> is um, the ease of the deployment as opposed to some of the more heavyweight infrastructure that yeah. is in place today. Do you think that's going to make a significant difference in adoption? Yeah, but so, the, so the question, which was a, a gimme from, from my sales guy, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get paid next week. <laughs> I don't know, it, it is, I mean, yes, we say that we have ease of deployment because it's a single jar and you can embed that in your app. So what's easier than that? Well, I mean, maybe what's easier than that is actually managed services, uh, where you don't even need to use your own hardware at all. So um, so later this year, Hazelcast is coming out with Hazelcast.cloud. That's what we're calling our managed service. We're gonna have like public managed service. Initially, it's gonna be on AWS. And then we'll have um, Hazelcast Cloud uh, VPC, Virtual Private Cloud, and then Hazelcast Cloud on-premise. And we'll have a Hazelcast Cloud orchestrator that's based on Docker and Kubernetes. So we're building all that, but you know, it just seems to be the best tool chain, and that's been going really well. So we're targeting Hazelcast IMDG for that initially, but, um, but we'll add Jet. I mean, one cool thing that we have like right now today, I don't know if anybody uses Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but in, um, in PipNet, um, you can actually um, go and actually use today IMDG as a service. You can also use Jet. So, so PCF is the first environment where you can actually just easily spin Jet up, um, and, and with without you know just a couple of commands. All right. Um, yeah. Talk a bit about security. 
appreciate for the price you can support or what you offer in front of the box? Right, so, so, Hazel, so I talked before about layering. So all the security, so, so Hazelcast itself, we, we don't, in either IMDG or Jet, we, um, if you wanted to encrypt the, so, so let me start over. In IMDG, um, we assume that you're putting the data in plain text into us and then you're relying on our security. So the security that we have is we have, we have TLS, we have TLS 1.2, we have a very high performance version of TLS. Um, we also have uh, Kerberos integration through Socket Interceptor. Um, we, have, um, we have ACLs on IMAP. Um, we have, um, so we have X509 certificates and you can run those on the server and on the, on the client. So for mutual authentication, uh, we have that. Um, we have LDAP integration. Um, Am I forgetting anything? I'm sure I'm forgetting a few things. Oh, the other thing is we have annual penetration tests done by Context.is. So we, last year we spent two and a half weeks pen testing ourselves. And we did about the same the year before, about due to do it again. So we're always, I don't know, did anybody hear about Memcrashed? You guys hear about that? The biggest DDoS ever. So it actually uses a vulnerability in Memcache which is not going to do too much for Memcache's popularity. That's so quite unfortunate. They say there's about 100,000 servers out on the internet which are accessible on the Memcache port that are being used. Um, somebody got hit, wasn't it GitHub? Got hit with 1.3 terabytes of traffic per second. Um, so yeah, that's just in the last week. Java, I mean, I'm mature enough. I mean, Java itself is, is, uh, is different from a security point of view. Um, you know, I would think better. It doesn't have the same types of buffer overflows and things, but I mean, having said that, there's so many different ways to penetrate a system. So, you know, we, we, you know, we have the security features, but then we also get the, um, the penetration testing done. And probably three or four times a year, because our biggest, as Joe said, our biggest industry vertical is banks, um, it's quite common for us to actually sign, for me to sign a form and then customer or prospect will actually do their own penetration test. The great thing about doing it ourselves is that we seldom get any surprises. With the support of the OpenX itself, you can control with our security Yeah, something that's quite... I mean, one, yeah, one thing that's happening in some organisations is that some of the CISOs are actually saying that forget about being an internal network, everything's going to be SSL or TLS all the time. All networks going to be TLS. So we kind of, um, we went back to the drawing board. We did a whole bunch of work on Java SSL engine, uh, which is what's built into Java 8. And, um, uh, you know, what we found is that we, we kind of, I think we had about a 75% performance reduction. And then we went and implemented um, with uh, OpenSSL. So we uh, use OpenSSL. With OpenSSL, um, with the ciphers, anyway, the one large company uses that we tested was only 6%. 6% degradation, so it's quite nice. So in JET, in JET, all of that stuff can be actually configured at the at the networking layer. So in JET, you have a JET.xml, and you also have a Hazelcast.xml for the embedded Hazelcast. Uh, but with a lot of streaming data, they're not penetrating from the out, they're Yeah, I mean, anything's possible. I mean, because with a computation engine, Obviously, an option that's that an option that is available when you just store data is that you can encrypt the data before you put it in the grid. You cannot do that when, when you're talking computation, because let's say you encrypted it, and then when we go to to do something with it, then you've got to unencrypt it. If we're unencrypting it, it also means that that we've got the key in our system, the unencrypt key. So immediately you've got a problem. So yeah, computation systems have to be processing in plain text. So it could be, I mean, if you've got sensitive data, you could have, this, you could have, rather than having the whole object encrypted, you could actually just have certain fields encrypted that you don't need for your computation. For example, a credit card. You know, you could have payments, you could have payments, um, have all the information about the payment, but, but not the credit card, have that encrypted. 
or, or actually just, or maybe even better, just have a token that indicates that you have to go and look up in another system. Yeah. This man still hasn't asked me a question.
Yes. Wow. Okay. All right, we're down to the bitter end. It's a nice shirt. Do you like the logo? I love the logo. I like the material. Okay. Where? Where? Okay. Where? We're going to throw you a softball question. We mentioned we're doing free training. Can you yeah. tell us when uh, those March training 21st. classes? March 20th and 21st. There you go. Wow. Whoa. Better be there. Wow. It's free. <laughs> it's free training. Okay, to finish off this awesome night, we have a, one more thing to give away. It is an Amazon gift card for $50. And let's see. Can I ask you to reach and mix it all up? You to look the other way, reach in, pull one out. Read it out. Uh, Ileana Zumakova. Ileana Zumakova. I found this flat on your name. Let's see. No, that's Ariana. That's a part. Ariana, I don't know, Zura something. Is there any Ariana's here? Well, once going twice, no. Wow. Reach in for another one. Take it out. Oh, you want to take it with the pipes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.